Hey guys, it's May from Markets with May, and today we're going to talk about enterprise value to EBITDA and price to earnings. Which is the better metric and what's the difference? And it's really exciting to me that more and more people are getting into fundamental analysis as this market starts to go a little haywire. But I noticed a lot of people using price to earnings when given the industry they're evaluating, given some of the things they're saying, they really should be thinking in terms of enterprise value to EBITDA. So I thought I'd make this video and clarify some things. Now in this video, we're gonna go through five things. First, we're gonna define terms so you're comfortable with the jargon. Second, we're gonna talk about why we take these metrics in the first place. What's it all mean? Third, we're gonna talk about when's it more appropriate to use one versus the other? What's going on there? Fourth, we're gonna talk about which industries and why it might be a little bit more relevant to do enterprise value to EBITDA. Finally, I'm gonna give you a few other considerations if you're looking at these metrics and how to think about these companies. But before we get into that, past performance is not indicative of future returns. And also, like everybody else, it's so helpful to me if you like, share, comment, or subscribe to my YouTube station. That helps me know what content is relevant, what do you wanna see, what should I be making? Now, let's get into these two metrics, enterprise value to EBITDA, price to earnings, What's the deal there? Now, what exactly is price to earnings and EV to EBITDA? Well, turns out price to earnings is just total fully diluted market cap divided by net income. Now, and earnings per share, as long as it's fully diluted as well, that's fine as well. Now, why do I keep saying fully diluted? It's because you really do want to take into consideration all the different share classes as well as uh, any options that are known that are outstanding on the stock so that you can really understand what is it that you, the shareholder, actually are buying into here at the price that you're buying into it at. Now let's talk about enterprise value to EBITDA. Well, enterprise value, what we're doing here is we're adding it back in the net debt, meaning all the debt minus the cash. And we do that because even if you're a shareholder, you are actually buying a company, the equity, and the liabilities that it owes. Now, you've got some layers of uh, help so that you're not liable for stupid things the company might do, uh, although you should be checking these companies to make sure they're not doing those stupid things. But essentially, a company that you buy still has to pay off its debt. It's got lenders, so you got to put that back into exactly what it is that you're buying. Enterprise value is going to take in that into consideration. Now let's talk about EBITDA. Now EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. And most people in the Northeast, in the banking sector, they're gonna call it EBITDA. I have heard some people call it EBITDA. And usually what they're trying to do is they're trying to stress that they're removing depreciation, amortization. Additionally, there've been a few very achieved individuals that I would never correct to their face who have called it EBITDA. As a result, if you hear it said that way, it's more typical that people in the South might say it that way, just let it go. But most people are gonna pronounce earnings before interest tax depreciation, that acronym, they're gonna pronounce it EBITDA. Now let's talk about what it is. Now EBITDA is just like earnings, a metric that's trying to get a sense for what exactly is it that this company makes. Now you're gonna take earnings and you're gonna subtract out the depreciation amortization and then interest and tax expense. Now let's start with depreciation amortization because I think that's the easier one for most people to understand. For a company, just like for yourself, if you own a home, depreciation and amortization is non-cash. Uh, it's something that you're doing uh, to the statements to basically lower your tax bill. And it turns out you gotta put that back in because quite frankly, I'm still getting cash. So even though it looks like I lost cash, I did not. So we wanna put depreciation amortization back in. And like I said, just like it's a house, it's gonna be particularly relevant if your company has a lot of fixed assets that it can depreciate, or alternatively, if it has certain types of intellectual property that also gets amortized. So you need to make sure that you put that DNA back in when you're thinking about the earnings power of a company. So interest income and taxes. Let's handle taxes first. That one's easy. The tax rate means not just the taxes that you owe when taxes go up and down, but also international taxes, which will also go up and down. And also, if you've got a company that happens to be selling assets like crazy and the moment they hit that sale, they gotta pay some kind of tax, that's also gotta be considered. 
if you take it out, which is why people do it sometimes, you get to not have that extra noise that's happening from a company that might be selling assets left and right and thereby some years incurring a tax bill associated with that and some years not. So EBITDA is going to be a cleaner metric as relates to tax adjustments that are happening from a lot of M&A activity that might be going on in the industry and with the company that you're evaluating. Now let's talk about interest. Interest is a little more complex. For a lot of folks, the interest portion is a loss that is coming from financing. But in some cases, you got a company that's paying down debt, that thing is swinging around like crazy. They might have had to pay a little bit of a fee to not have to pay debt going forward. And that activity might really make sense for the long-term health of the company. Additionally, some companies own subsidiaries that pay them in interest, and that's gonna come out a certain way in that interest number. A lot of times what people do is they'll use EBITDA because they want to remove all of that noise as well. And then they want to look at interest income separately, particularly if it's just a really high number for that particular company. So removing the DNA, removing the interest in taxes, we get a cleaner idea with EBITDA of how much is this company earning me each year. And a lot of you might be thinking, wow, that sounds a whole lot like cash flow, May. Why are we using cash flow? Well, um, you know, there's different reasons. You can use operating cash flow. Some people do that, and some people use pre cash flow. It just kind of depends on your cup of tea and what it is. But EBITDA is oftentimes looped in with these cash flow numbers that are all trying to get to the same thing, which is relative to what I paid. What's this company earning for me each year? Now, why then do I even care about EV to EBITDA? Well, turns out that a lot of times when you adjust for the amount of debt and then you put the earnings relative to that, you end up with a much lower return or yield on your earnings. So certain companies that just have crazy amounts of debt, um, most of what you're buying is the fact that they got to pay that back. Now, additionally, if you're in an industry or if you're coming out of a period of time where there was a ton of mergers and acquisitions, and let me tell you, if you think you weren't in a period of a lot of mergers and acquisitions, just think all the new slow items, Google it out, how many deals were done in the last year. Uh, there were a lot of acquisitions that were done. There were a lot of spinning out of companies that were done. It was absolutely something that will still allow you to see a clear picture if you're using EBITDA as the metric to really establish what's this company making me. Particularly during periods where M&A activity is crazy hot and one company's buying another company, remember, they're really gonna have to take on that debt. So the price that they're paying for that company's earnings yield is gonna have to be uh, taken into consideration the fact that there's a bunch of debt on the balance sheet and so on and so forth. Depreciation and amortization, um, you know, they get to do a couple of accounting things associated with that. So you also kind of want that adjusted if you're going to buy the company. And um, if there's cash, obviously, if I'm going to buy the company, I'm just going to take in a bunch of cash. That's great, too. Now, the other little nuance of this, why do we care? Why are we even thinking about these metrics? It's really because what we're trying to do is compare is this company cheap or is that company cheap? So company A has a PE of eight, company B has a PE of 10. Turns out that even if one is $100 and one is $200, whatever company has the lower PE, you're actually paying less for that company because when you give them a dollar, they're gonna give you more back if they have a lower PE uh, than if they have a higher PE. That's what this is about. It's about trying to understand when I give a company a dollar, what do they make off that dollar? Because I'm now a shareholder as soon as I own that company. Now, in the case of uh, PE, it's just the bottom line earnings. In the case of EBITDA, I get to really understand what the operating income is. And I prefer knowing what the operating income, less all that noise is, because that noise can change often, a lot, quickly. And also, if we go through multiple different periods over the years of mergers and acquisitions or tax changes or all this other stuff, I still want to be able to compare year one to two years ago or whatever is going on. Now, that brings me to point three, which one is better? Now, for some people who are you know, kind of really new, price to earnings may seem like a great metric because you want to take everything into consideration. Ultimately, you are paying for the earnings power of the company. But for most fundamental folks, you're going to prefer EV to EBITDA. And then 
a whole series of other things. Let me not make little of what fundamental folks do, but you're going to prefer EV to EBITDA because you're going to have some sense for given the debt and cash situation, what does this company actually throw off in the way of returns? What does the company actually make independent of these things that can get modified very, very quickly. Additionally, I prefer EV to EBITDA because it makes companies across industries more comparable. Finally, I like EV to EBITDA slightly better because in periods of mergers and acquisitions, if I just use earnings, it looks like earnings will swing left and right as a company divests or does a series of corporate actions that are probably something that I like versus not like. So then it looks really strange when I go to do growth rates if I'm using earnings as a metric instead of some kind of cash flow type thing, which in this case, EBITDA is what we're talking about. In, the, in this video. So EVD beta is going to be a lot better for most situations. And number four, let's talk about which industries is it most important to maybe use EVD beta instead of price to earnings. And that's going to be pretty much any industry that has a lot of corporate action going on, or additionally, companies that just happen to have a lot of depreciation and amortization. And that actually is quite a lot of industries. Within media, companies that have a lot of intellectual property like uh, movies and films, they're going to amortize that. Similarly, if you are in fixed asset companies like factories you've got or mining equipment or, you know, oil rigs. So energy for sure, industrials, uh, materials companies, those are going to have huge, uh, huge DNA that you need to consider. Finally, another group that definitely is going to be beneficial to use EV to EBITDA versus price to earnings is going to be healthcare. And in particular, I'm talking about your farm and biotechs that are a little bit more seasoned. You got to think about it this way. Those companies definitely have fixed assets, but they got a lot of intellectual property. That's what those drugs really are. Additionally, some of them throw off tons of cash and they have varying degrees of debt depending on what's going on. If you're using price to earnings, you're going to get a significantly different picture depending on what the company is. And it turns out as well within healthcare, these companies buy each other. So you really ought to know what EV to EBITDA is going in so you can figure out who's really cheap, who's got a crazy great multiple that they might be able to buy someone with on the cheap and what is exactly going on there. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is other considerations when using either EV to EBITDA or price to earnings. One of my biggest bugbears I'm going to talk about first is when people use these in a silo. Okay, you cannot just similarly, there's a period of time when a lot of building products companies had asbestos liability and those things traded very, very cheap on EV to EBITDA and price to earnings. And if you did it at the wrong time, okay, big important thing at the wrong time, it would have been the wrong call for you to get into them just because you were using that metric. So it's really, like I said, very important that if you start to use these metrics, that you start to really investigate and ask those questions of why, and then look at other fundamental things. In the case of liability, you're going to look at the risk disclosures. Now, in that same vein, if the company has a really high price to earnings or a really high enterprise value to EBITDA, that's not a reason to think that you ought to sell it. In a lot of cases, there could be a ton of growth going on, or alternatively, it could just be that in that industry, other companies are more than willing to pay that because there's something else going on at that company that's wonderful. Perhaps they have patents that that company believes that it can absolutely monetize better than the management team of the company in question. So you cannot just use any one metric in a silo. It's my biggest bugbear, but I see it all the time. Now, the last little thing that I'm going to mention is that high PE companies can actually use their stock to purchase another company. And you'll notice this sometimes when one company A buys another company and the terms of the deal is that the company that's being bought gets stock from the company that's buying. And so sometimes when the entire market lifts these multiples higher, you're going to see accentuated mergers and acquisitions activity because they can buy a company either with their own stock or they can buy a company with all cash and it just kind of depends. So realize that sometimes when the multiples are high, that is something that is possible out there as well. Um, so it's always good to take a look at what's going on with price to earnings and also EV to EBITDA. Now why EV to EBITDA? Because it starts to get a little bit messy if the company has a lot of debt 
you know, you, so you kind of want to also take that into consideration versus just a high earnings multiple. That's all I have prepared for this episode. If you still have questions, I would love to hear from you. Stick it in the comments below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Similarly, if you use EVD EBITDA in a different way than I've described, well, I don't always get every single thing. So I would love to hear from you. I would love to have you add on to this in case folks can see it in the comments as well. Finally, in closing, if you enjoyed this content, I would love it if you would thumbs up my video, share, comment below, or if you would subscribe to my station, that always helps me again know what content to prepare. Until next time, good luck in these markets.